Hi everyone, I'm Gary Nall. We're going to be sharing a lot of positive information today. I believe I'm in empowering people. It doesn't seem like everyone seems to be angry about something. And a lot of people are rightly concerned that nothing is positively changing in their direction. So we're going to deal with this from several different perspectives. First on health. For example, from Kashu University in Japan, I'm going to talk about how a soy protein is able to reduce the, uh, enter the brain and help it and reduce some of the damage that otherwise might be going on in your brain. And I'm also going to have two regular, not holistic, just regular, board certified, highly respected, deeply credentialed medical doctors on, one's an MD and a lawyer, who are telling the truth about the COVID virus, and they risk their reputations. Mind you, these are not cutting-edge people. These are not the alternative. These are, these are right in the middle of the mix of your average physicians practicing the best medicine they can, and they're calling out the lies and deceptions and frauds with COVID. You'll hear them. Very important. But also, I'm going to end our show today by sharing some really uplifting motivation. Choose your life lessons, or the universe will choose them for you. A lot of people, you've heard me say, are not going to change. Certain groups won't change no matter what happens. That's the senior citizens. There'll be a few exceptions. But having worked in my career with a lot of older people, they are always resistant to the very change that could save their lives. You can argue the merits of why they resist, stubbornness, the contentiousness, resistance to change, comfort, and fear of something that's different, or some other reason. But at the end of it, they're not gonna they're not gonna be joining the revolution. So as a group, don't count upon them. Professionals people within the advanced educational groups, generally the higher social classes, the physician scientists, professors, business people. I'm not talking about major corporate business people. I'm talking about small business people. They work hard. They put in long hours. They make a lot of sacrifices. And yet, because of the lessons not learned by the baby boomers, my generation, they are now spending as much or more than what they're earning. So imagine who's going to get creamed the most. There'll be people who will be able to survive because they never had much to begin with. They've lived lives of financial insecurity, food insecurity, educational insecurity. They don't know when anything's going to happen or if it will. And we have a lot of those. But interestingly enough, you put those people in a bad situation, they'll adapt to it. You put a wealthier person, highly educated person, a person that's lived their life in a bubble, and they just completely collapse. They have no strength of character whatsoever. You don't see them in the marches. You don't see them in the demonstrations. I'll give you just one example of this. One of our callers who listens to the show from Albany said that they were going to pass a bill that would mandate that every health professional in the state must take four vaccines, the H1N1 vaccine, which was extremely toxic. And uh, all four were going to have 24 micrograms of mercury. That's a huge dose of mercury that far and exceeds anything any government agency says is safe. And if you worked in any healthcare facility, you had to get these vaccines. So that I had one day, so I told the audience, join me. We'll create a car caravan. We'll rent a bus. And indeed, the next morning, there were 1,600 of us that went up to Albany, all just spontaneous. We had artists there like Elaine Ryan, who is a social activist, and she was writing really neat captions on people's boards. We clearly had a couple of Asian provocateurs because everything they were doing would be undermining our cause. And I spoke with them and asked them, what are you here for? <clears throat> what is your intent? Because if your intent is to challenge the state's right to force a, a vaccine mandate, that's not what your posters say. You're drawing negative attention to yourself and as a result, our cause. And by the way, I've had that happen before, like at Indian Point, 
nuclear power plant where we had a demonstration at the plant, and we had five major network media there. And I had brought in from around the United States the our country's best anti-nuclear um, people. And uh, we were all set. Each was, each of us were going to speak short for a short period of time on one topic. And next thing you know, a group goes out and lays down on the street, <laughs> wanting to get arrested. Well, of course, you know exactly what's going to happen. The police are going to go over there and to arrest them. These people have nothing to do with anti-nuke, but the attention is going to go to them. Then the media is going to go and film them, and none of our messages will get out. You have to understand how agent provocateurs work. You have to understand how smart they are and how every single peaceful group in America has been infiltrated. And uh, from the Black Panthers on, they managed to, they managed to infiltrate and then separate, fractionalize, and put out negative messages. Even the FBI, almost 99% of all the people who are supposed to be terrorists blowing up stuff, they weren't terrorists. They coaxed them into doing it and then supplied them with their materials, then arrested them. You know, th that's, that's the kind of crap that goes on. In any case, we finally got everyone in a long line going clear across the state capitol. We each got up and gave our talk. And so we're, uh, uh, two of us were invited in to meet with all the top uh, commissioners of health in the state. And we laid forth our argument. And while we were doing this, I had a group all dressed, and I asked them, dressed in suits and business suits as if you worked in the Capitol, wear a briefcase. And inside the briefcase, we had 119 articles showing why mercury in vaccines was dangerous, why the H1N1 vaccine was dangerous and unproven, and why we should have open hearings because there have been no hearings whatsoever open to the public. Well, no one stopped them. So they just were very polite. Here's something that we'd like for you to take a look at. And they gave it to every legislator. Well, then they had to back off. Then they had to have hearings. And, uh, and we did have hearings, and we were able to stop it. And, uh, and my hearing, my hearing, which is excoriating, I was first in line at the beginning at 8 o'clock. It's the first one to sign up. Therefore, I should have been the first to be able to testify that I had dead last, 8 o'clock at night, 12 hours because they didn't want the media hearing what I had to say. Thank goodness someone filmed it uh, with their cell phone, and it's up there. You can go see it. It's, it's a hard-hitting talk. In any case, guess who didn't show up? Just guess. Not a single medical doctor, not a single nurse, not a single person who would have been impacted showed up. You showed up. The people showed up. So when you've been to hundreds, leads, hundreds of demonstrations for against genetically engineered foods and for mandatory vaccines and, <clears throat> and against pesticide goes clear back. Okay? And we're going to close it off with lessons because if you don't learn these lessons at some point, if you don't feel enough pain to change and you're not going to change anything, you're going to assume someone's going to do the change for you and therefore trust some group. Let me tell you, I don't trust any group, no group. Do you really think that any group out there that's asking for you to let them do all the planning and all the politicking for you has you only your interest at stake? No. These are all hidden political agendas in the writing roughshod. And these people take no prisoners. These are tough, tough people. <clears throat> You'll be seeing the real side of them in the very near future. Okay, now let's get to the health issues because I'm sure you're going to want to hear what these doctors had to say. Now, a separate study, aside from that one that was published in Science of Food, which again shows you that non-GMO'd soy taken as part of an overall healthy diet will provide you with, let's say, like L-tyrosine, the amino acid, and proline. And these, these are very important, and uh, they get through the blood-brain barrier, and they can help with, uh, with Alzheimer's, meaning... You want anti-inflammatory nutrients in the body because this helps reduce the negative brain impairment. So just have yourself a, you know, some soy um, miso soup. Have yourself some soy protein. It's not a big deal. You don't have to take a lot of it. Now, for those of you who are going to visit any place in the world where you can get malaria, 
from Wallo University College of Medicine, Ethiopia, they found that an extract made of olive leaf. Now, we know that olive leaf is strongly antibacterial and strongly antiviral. It's in everyone's natural medicine chest, and you should travel with this small two-ounce tincture of it. So what they found is uh, in East Africa, including Ethiopia, the leaf and bark extracts of olives are used for the treatment of parasitic infections like malaria and a potentially fatal disease transmitted through the bite of the female uh, anophile mosquitoes. Malaria is caused by a protozoan parasite that infests and then you end up getting really sick. Now, a lot of people have had it many times and survive it, but it destroys your immune system in the process. So, one more reason to look at the natural way of helping with these conditions. Why don't we do this? Why don't we have an, a legitimate organization, you know, like Doctors Without Borders, one that we know we can trust, and why don't we do some fund drives and purchase at cost from manufacturers, and there's many manufacturers of all all of the extract, but in bulk, and send it to all the villages we can where they have mosquito infestation so that people can use something natural and non-toxic. And why not also at the same time send them some vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, selenium, zinc, uh, and some other nutrients in a single bottle and give it to them. Now, my brother, as a, as a gesture, can get every, everyone, every pregnant woman in the Dominican Republic free vitamins for pregnancy and also help get the kids chelated for heavy metals and did the same thing. He helped get the lead out of gasoline in India. That was no small feat. And now he takes a group of uh, physicians twice a year down the Dominican Republic and they treat all these people for free. These are very conscientious people. Why can't we help people, the millions who are infected and a lot die every year from malaria? Something we can do. I'm just suggesting why not look at the positive side of what can be done inexpensively because manufacturers will jump in and help out. So if anyone wants to help do this project, just let me know. Go to prn.fm. You go to send an email saying you'd like to volunteer to help pull all this together, and I'll give you the information that you would need. Uh, it's prnstudio at gmail.com. Also, we have learned from the University of Utah the differences in the rate that genetic mutations accumulate in healthy young adults could help predict remaining lifespan in both men and women, and uh, that's important. So the rate that you cause your DNA to be damaged and your capacity to have genetic mutations because of the damage will determine how long you're going to live. And you can do that early in life. Now, one of the things that we've achieved, and almost all of our results are in, uh, the ones on campus, the last blood test is being taken today uh, with the gym exercises tomorrow and then the power walk on Wednesday. And then the ones at home, we're getting them in one at a time. So the whole thing will be done probably within three weeks. But at the heart and basis of everything is this. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that you have 75 trillion cells. Some people have less, some people have more. Every single second of the day, those cells are doing something. They're not dormant. Now, every time you do anything wrong, now set aside why you do it wrong. You may justify it in your mind. You, you were very stressed. You had to do this. You, you did that. But your cell takes a beating for it. Now, on average, every 24 hours, each one of those, let's say, 75 trillion cells has 10,000 gene alterations where so many free radicals hit it, so many inflammatory cytokines hit it, that you alter it. You mutate your DNA. So you're no longer going to have that DNA help you in the future. It's mutated. You could end up with cancer or some other condition, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, whatever the, wherever the damage is, more often than not, that's where you're going to have the problem. So if you were simply to take a disciplined 
approach to life, which most people refuse to. They absolutely out and out refuse. But for those who are willing to do that, you could cut that 10,000 gene alteration down to about two by having nothing that's pro-inflammatory, no coffee, no sugar, no meat, no alcohol, no tobacco, uh, different pharmaceutical drugs. All these things cause these mutations. So that's the first stage. And then what you do to repair that damage can then bring it down not only to no gene alterations, but positive gene support. You're actually rebuilding the DNA. So now you have two people 30 years old, but one has done a lot of binge drinking and drugs and has been sedentary and stressed, and his or her genes could be really damaged. So the chronological age is going to be way, way less than the biological age. So they're 30 chronologically. They might be 50 biologically. That's why we're seeing dementia in people 30 and 40 years old. Let's say the other person was on a healthy plant-based diet and exercised out with stress and juiced and took right supplements. That person at 30 could now be 20 because they've repaired DNA. So now they have the functioning DNA. Now, that's the whole premises and then all the different protocols that go into it for the anti-aging. Well, University of Utah just said the same thing here. They just didn't do the study, but they, they explained the aging process. What we do early in life determines how long we're going to live. And this was published in Scientific Reports, the Review Journal. And finally, frankincense, the herb, can help alleviate symptoms of anxiety and depression. Two universities, Hebrew University in Jerusalem and John Hopkins, did the study. So studies have proven the psychoactive effects of scent of frankincense on the brain, and it helps alleviate symptoms of anxiety and depression. Now, this was a major study, so that's good news. Now, also Boswellia resin also can be used as well. There's a lot of things can be used, but that's just what they're saying is uh, good and can be used. Good. Something else to add. And if you're a diabetic, um, a University of Medical Science in Iran showed that curcumin and piperine, P-I-P-E-R-I-N-E, when you take the two together, it supports heart-healthy uh, ways if you're diabetic. It helps your heart protects your heartbeat for diabetes. So just your curcuminoids are naturally occurring, uh, very, very good uh, nutrients for your heart and turns off inflammation, including in the heart. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about what happens when lovers touch. Their breathing and heartbeat synchronizes. Pain is eliminated. All kinds of wonderful things happen. This is Study University of Colorado, but I'm going to get into it in some depth tomorrow. That's it for this opening. We're 19 minutes into our program. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. And when we come back from the break, we're going to hear two regular, highly qualified physicians take a risk and say that what we're doing concerning coronavirus is wrong, deadly, and, well, you, you make up your mind for yourself. Back in a moment. Dr. Dan, why have you decided to speak out? Well, I, I've decided to speak out because I think that we're dealing with a tragic situation where the scientific process has been violated. Uh, studies have been published that uh, had not been adequately vetted and should not have been published. And those studies were used uh, to terminate further evaluations of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I've decided to speak out because the political interference in the physician decision-making process is objectionable and should not be allowed to continue. Uh, there are lessons to be learned from this pandemic on many levels. We've spoken about the dangers uh, and the irrationality of the lockdown process. We've spoken about the violation of the scientific uh, purity of investigation. Uh, we've spoken about uh, media uh, presentations and misrepresentations uh, of data. Um, this is uh, injurious to the health of our population now, 
and uh, I don't want to see this uh, replicated in the future. I think as physicians we have a moral responsibility to protect our patients, to protect the science uh, behind our medical decisions, and to prevent intrusions into the purity of the scientific process by outside forces uh, that uh, may have bad intent. Uh, and it's important to speak out. It's, it's, uh, it's a moral imperative for us to speak out and to protect our patients and to protect our profession. Dr. Gold, uh, what's, why did you decide to speak out? So I decided to speak out for one very specific reason. That was I was actually presented with a definite COVID positive patient and I prescribed hydroxychloroquine and zinc because I was very up on the literature on this and I got severely reprimanded for it. And I also had received a letter from the state board threatening all doctors, I was just one, with potential um, investigation into me for unprofessional conduct if I was to prescribe hydroxychloroquine. This was so shocking to me. It had never happened where the government told a physician if they had a right or not a right to prescribe an FDA-approved medication. I mean, that was just a sui generis event that, that took me by surprise. And I thought to myself, if doctors don't speak up, we're really all lost. Let me, let me add one other thing, if I might. Yep. So I, you know, I think it's important in terms of people's perspective about the impact of COVID that they understand that the data now show that 99.7% of people infected with COVID will survive. 0.3% die. And the vast majority of those people who die, as we've discussed, are the elderly, the frail, those at end of life. And that's not to say that we don't care about those deaths. On the contrary, we feel that many of those deaths could have been and should have been prevented had the proper precautions been taken, as were taken in the state of Florida, in contrast to how things were handled in the state of New York, the state of New Jersey, the state of Pennsylvania, where the nursing homes were not protected and were forced to take people who were actively infected. Uh, what we needed to do was not lock down all of society, not shut down schools, not shut down all businesses. We needed to protect the elderly particularly the elderly in the nursing homes. It's a small segment of our population. We could have allowed the rest of the population to continue with their lives, take adequate precautions, but not be completely shut down. The cost of the shutdown in terms of the physical, emotional, and psychological health of people is enormous. We're, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg of people who have been shut in who've lost their businesses, who are facing depression, uh, who are facing uh, issues of mental health because of the consequences. This should never happen again. If we ever face this kind of situation again, we need to learn the lessons from the mistakes in policy that were implemented. So it recently came out that the coronavirus isn't as contagious as they thought, uh, especially for asymptomatic carriers. Uh, is this big news in the medical field? Have you guys known this? And what does that really mean for you know, the precautions they've been taking? You know, whenever you review the CDC studies, you can see that it wasn't affecting young people. Uh, this has been, I think, a tragedy that we've locked down our young people. Again, this data is widely available to anybody who wants to search it out, cdc.gov. You could see people based on their ages. And it hardly affects teenagers and youths under 20, 30, 40. Really, under age 60, it does not have a higher lethality rate than common influenza. So I was not surprised. As Dr. Gold said, I think that the focus should have been on protecting the high-risk population. And we knew from the data that had come out from China and from Italy and from France that the people at risk were the elderly and the frail people immunocompromised. As Dr. Gold said, young people had very little risk from this infection. Uh, they rarely got ill from it. So it was not a good decision to shut down schools, to shut down all businesses. Uh, and it certainly was not a good decision to send actively infected coronavirus patients to nursing homes. So th the strategy was inverted. We should have protected the people in the nursing homes and given those homes more resources to protect the people at risk. 
and the low-risk population should have been allowed to live their lives. We could have had some precautions in terms of social distancing and masks, perhaps, but to close down the entire society when, in fact, it's just a small segment of that society that's at risk, I think was a tragic mistake. You know, I work in the emergency department, so I see people of all ages. And uh, I would really, my heart would sink whenever I would see a nursing home patient because I knew right behind that nursing home patient, there's five more and ten more behind that one. It flies through the nursing homes. First of all, they're immune compromised. You cannot be a nursing home patient unless you have a skilled nursing need. These are just not ordinary older people. These are people that have at least one pretty serious medical condition. Many of them have three or four serious medical conditions. Obviously, this is going to fly through the nursing homes, and they can't fight it. So when I, as an emergency physician, would see people with COVID-19, the ones that got really sick are the nursing home patients. Sometimes a person who wasn't in a nursing home was also sick, very sick. But I almost never see a younger person or a healthy person that was sick enough that had to be even hospitalized, let alone severely ill and needing something like intubation. And always in life there's limited resources, and the resources need to go where they can be most useful. What we did is we spread all our resources out amongst society at large. That, I think, was criminal and immoral. We needed to spread, focus the resources on the people that needed it, our nursing home patients. As a specific example that I know off the top of my head, in Pennsylvania, the average age of the person who died from COVID-19 was 79. At the same time, the life expectancy was 78.7. So, of course, all deaths are tragic. All of us have parents whom we love. However, it's in a different category when a person who's passed the life expectancy passes versus a person who's 20 and passes. So when the average person sees these numbers that are calculated every day, 100,000 Americans have died. They're not able to put that in context because the media is not giving the context. Do you know how many Americans die every year? The average American doesn't know. The question is how many more people died due to COVID-19 that were not going to already die, let's say within this year? That number is very low. And I, I think there's going to have to be some reckoning when this is all over, how we really harmed and killed nursing home patients. Yeah, the, the, this, the data certainly were known. We knew this as early as February from China, from Italy, that it was the elderly and frail who were most at risk. So why did Governor Cuomo and his health commissioner force the nursing homes to take patients? Well, it was part of the overall panic that occurred not just in among society, but at, in the healthcare industry. The hospitals in New York and throughout the country were afraid that they would be overwhelmed with patients and they wouldn't have sufficient capacity. And they wanted to offload patients who were no longer requiring inpatient uh, high intensity care. And they said, we need to let those people go out of the hospital and you, where can you send them? Well, there were places in New York where they could have sent them the Javits Center, which had been equipped, the Navy ship uh, Comfort that, that had been sent you know, to the New York Harbor. Instead, they were sent to nursing homes where it created massive death. Uh, this was a, a tragic mistake, a, you know, just absolute negligence in terms of decision making. Yeah, so the Comfort and the Javits Center were shockingly empty. They were almost completely empty, which was amazing. The question of why Governor Cuomo did this, it's very... Uh, unpleasant to speculate, but one thing that's for sure is it was absolutely known when he made the decision to let the patients go back to the nursing homes, it was 100% known. I understand looking back, people will wonder, was it known? There's no question. You can go back and you can look at the dates of these things. It was absolutely known that it was risky to send the nursing home patients back. You know, the, the health commissioner of Pennsylvania really had an egregious situation where she took her own mother out of an assisted living facility but she told the rest of the state that it was perfectly safe to leave your grandparent in an assisted living facility. That's just egregious. There's no question that it was known at the time. I, I, I don't know why this was the plan. You know, people always wonder why the, the deaths were so high in New York. There's no question that the nursing home deaths put them over the top. I mean, ap you know, no question. And a fact that's often missed is that patients that got sick in the nursing home were often sent to the hospital and died. Those do not even count as COVID deaths attributable to the nursing home. That doesn't even count. So whatever the number is, it's higher. You have an interesting contrast between the state of New York and the state of Florida. In the state of New York, the nursing homes were not protected. They were not given adequate PPE, protective equipment. They were not given adequate resources, and they were forced 
by the governor, by the health commissioner, by the mayor of New York City, to accept people who were discharged from the hospital and were still actively infected with coronavirus. And guess what happened? Just as what you would predict would have happened, you had thousands of deaths. It's estimated that as many as 40, even even 50% of the deaths in New York were nursing home patients. This was preventable. The proof of it is the state of Florida, where the governor, Governor DeSantis, said, let's protect the nursing homes. And his health commissioner said, let's work on protecting the nursing homes, not allowing visitors, checking everyone who comes in to make certain that there's no evidence of infection, giving them adequate resources, and certainly not allowing any people with active infection to go into the nursing homes. So the mortality rate in the nursing homes in Florida was small. And, the over, and Florida, as most people know, has a, has a large percentage of elderly people, not just in nursing homes, but throughout the society. You have all the snowbirds who come down from you know, the Northeast. So it shows you with good policies, with rational thinking, you can protect people, and we could have had a much lower death rate and death count in this country had people followed the policies that were uh, used in the state of Florida. And there is a lot of talk going around now about hydroxychloroquine. People are saying it's very dangerous. The news is really hammering it. Um, Is that, uh, Dr. Dan, is hydroxychloroquine something that you think is dangerous? Is it something you've prescribed to patients before? I've prescribed it. I've also recommended it to people, and I've had conversations with physicians literally around the globe, uh, in Israel, in Italy, in England, and uh, the East Coast of the United States. Uh, and, uh, And I've read the literature extensively. So... Hydroxychloroquine definitely has a role. That role is specific. It's an antiviral agent that is effective in the early stages of infection. When used in that, in that uh, context, it is effective and it is safe. Uh, unfortunately, there have been studies that uh, have looked at hydroxychloroquine but have looked at it in the wrong context. They have looked at it in severely, critically ill people in the hospital setting. At that point, the antiviral isn't effective because you've gone beyond viral infection to an immune-mediated, widespread inflammatory reaction. So that was the wrong population to look at. Okay. Now, here's why what they said is important. Because first, she said she's being threatened, as all doctors are, if they use the drug. And yet, the basis of the media saying that it's so dangerous They're tying it into Trump. Trump should have no play in this. Um, And I'll deal with Matt Tabibi's commentary about Trump tomorrow. He's spot on and the left losing their mind. And he's absolutely spot on there as well. But there was an article published in the British Medical Journal and uh, and then or the Lancet. And then it was also published in New England Medical Journal. And that was like the nails in the coffin. No more. No more of this drug only to be retracted, not, not voluntarily rescinded, retracted, meaning it was garbage. And it turns out that the company that was used to do all the statistics didn't do any of the statistics accurately. It was a fraudulent study. So there are, and we've looked at this very carefully, done properly, it has a place. Done improperly, it is dangerous. But the media is all or nothing. If you notice, there's no in-between on anything in the media today. It's, uh, you're, you're either one of us or you're against us. You can't, be, you can't have your own opinion on anything today, and that's unfortunate. On su- Saturday, I was invited uh, to give a, uh, a lecture. It was supposed to be about 30 minutes. It went almost two hours um, on Zoom, and there was a group of people – who were on the line, and one of them was uh, James with the Green Party. And I said, James, the Green Party has been on the right side of almost every political issue, every environmental issue. They were ahead of everyone. In fact, the new Democratic radical base has stolen their idea, plagiarized their material, not given the Green Party any credit, and tried to use it as if it were their own, with no knowledge of how to implement any of these things. And I've challenged a hundred times what's wrong with what happens when 
politicians and mercenary self-interested people take on an important issue like, you know, how do you fund uh, universal health care? And they don't know. They're clueless. They have no sense of scholarship. They have no patience to do any real research. And we've laid it out in articles and broadcasts how it can be completely self-funding and save trillions of dollars a year. They don't want any of that material. And we've sent it to all of them. The Green Party would use that. So I said in the future, understand, Ralph Nader was right, Gary Anderson was right, Jill Stein was right, and everyone on the left was wrong about everything. They supported intervention in countries, regime changes in countries, hydrofracking, um, all the things that you would never support if you were a decent, moral, and ethical human being, they supported. But the American public thinks there's only two parties, a duopoly, both controlled by elites, if they just knew more about what the Greens were representing. So my hope is that at some point the Green Party sends me over their current uh, list of things they support, and I'll share it with the audience. But I promised you to do a my concern about baby boomers, but then someone sent me something. I just read it. This is from a Professor Gregory Foster at the National Defense University, a West Point graduate, and a veteran of the Vietnam War. It's called Baby Boomers, Incapable of Greatness. It's a short read, but it's spot on. Uh, quote, Several years back, about 20 by my count, I expressed my views in a local newspaper about the manifest failings of my baby boomer generation. What I considered then to be revealed truth is now truer than ever. When was the last time you stopped to ponder who's been running the country for the past two plus decades? And moreover, what it all means. If the Trump presidency, especially in the face of crisis and tragedy, has done nothing else, it has pied up us to the face. Failure, thy name is Boomer. Boomer, thy name is failure. <clears throat> we, have, we have now truly reached the zenith. Make that the matter of our achievements. We are suffering from the worst of the worst my generation has to offer this country in the way of leadership. In virtually every walk of life, government and politics, to be sure, but also business, religion, education, science, and the arts, we baby boomers have been in charge, and it's been an ugly picture. I've not only am not proud of being a boomer, I'm embarrassed, even ashamed. I could name names, but I don't need to do that. Just look around at either end of the Pennsylvania Avenue, the domestic heartland more generally or internationally, and if you think you want to call my hand by offering up counterexamples, a Bill Gates maybe, or an Oprah Winfrey, or Michael Jordan, I'm willing to bet your examples are either popular celebrities or, more likely, anonymous little people whose consistent good deeds on behalf of the rest of us little people are known only to us. What distinguishes our generation's so-called leaders is that they owe their standing, such as it is, to nothing more than having occupied positions of leadership, not to actually leading. These individuals and many more like them aren't the brightest or best, nor the most virtuous or competent among us, generally quite the opposite. But they have clearly been the most ambitious. As such, they define who we are and how history will remember us. Whatever we boomers may have been or done in our individual capacities, on the big matters that legacies are made of, we have been outclassed, out of our depth, unable to offer the strategic leadership that would leave something of value to prosperity and uh, posterity. And most importantly, we have shown ourselves singularly incapable of greatness. Maybe there's something to former NBC News anchor Tom Brokaw's claim that the World War II generation of our parents was the greatest generation any society has ever produced. We'll overlook the fact that they bequeathed us the Cold War, nuclear weapons, and McCarthyism. What defined that generation and supported the claim to greatness Brokaw has noted, was sacrifice, selflessness, modesty, and most of all, signal, uh, signal achievement. By contrast, boomers have, for the most part, never had to make significant sacrifices. We didn't live through the crippling depression, and we didn't have to go wage a grand, glorious, unifying war against uh, the, the region evil. Ours was a pointless, prolonged, uh, desultory, and even, I say, pointless war 
the divided the few who served from the many who didn't and left a permanent scar on the psyche of a generation. Boomers are anything but selfless and modest. In the main, we are totally selfish, self-absorbed, self-indulgent, self-serving. Our most visible members are unrepentantly shameless self-promoters, intent on being someone rather than doing something. Given the choice between mingling with celebrities and bettering the human condition, we'll take the former every time. During our coming of age, we, when inexperience and unworldliness should have made us the most modest, we were the most impatient and intolerant. We all had the answers, even if we didn't understand the questions. Hypercritical then, we are hypercritical now. Those who refused to serve when it was our turn are now among the most strident, hawkish flag wavers around. And, the most, of the, and most of those who were vehemently anti-establishment then have now sold out or been bought out into the system. Most notably, there's the matter of achievement. Remember the famous lines from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night? So are born great, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Given the improbability of being born great and the random and frequency of great events, true greatness is almost all about achievement. So have we boomers achieved anything worthy of the ages? The answer, plain and simple, is no. We've been too busy getting ahead. Greatness requires vision, courage, and boldness, none of which we have to offer. We're reformed malcontents, turn myopic creatures of convention, perpetrators and exploiters of the status quo, technocrats posing as statesmen. Opportunism is our motive, force, rhetoric, our standard. From us, you're not, from us, you've got, uh, you're not gotten and won't get sweeping new ideas, institutions, or initiatives that can live in perpetuity and inspire future generations. We still don't have a clue how to get beyond the Cold War, achieve comprehensive health care, reform education, end racism, or rid politics of the corrupting influence of money and incompetence. Surely you don't expect us then to live up to the rhetoric of our youth and eliminate poverty, injustice, war, and craft an enduring post-millennial ideology or create futuristic global institutions. What's in it for us? There's a verse of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow that is especially relevant here. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave us behind us footprints on the sand of time. How regrettable that my generation, oblivious to what it takes to achieve sublimity, seems destined to leave no imprint on the sand of time. One only hopes we have set the bar of achievement so low that succeeding generations will clear it with ease for the country's good. End quote. And that was from a professor, Gregory D. Foster. Uh, good for him. I had something a little different to share, but that's all right. Uh, I thought that his was very good. And what I'm going to do now, this will only be for people who are I'm going to I don't have enough time left in the program to play the clip I was going to play about learn your lessons with universal teaching for you. I'll do that tomorrow. But I like your thoughts. I want to hear from some of you at this moment. Our talk back number is 888-874-4888. And here's the question I'd like for you to address. If you agree that that the the generation that has controlled almost everything in the world, remember the Clintons, baby boomers, Trump, a baby boomer, Obama, at, just barely into the um, baby boomer. But look at the world today. Look at a man that we gave a Nobel Peace Prize and he turned around and became the leader of regime changes in seven countries. Look at the death of all the people of color. How can someone support someone who is a mass murderer and is, and is noted for crimes against humanity? How can you believe someone that their own leaked email shows that they're intentionally lying to you, using you 
signing uh, deals to do the pipeline across Native American lands, burial lands, historical lands. The State, State Department, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, who headed State Department, Obama, all supported that. And that came out uh, when the emails were leaked. But how do you say that Native American lives matter? Or do you even think it? Have we limited ourselves to who lives matter? To me, I see sacredness in all things until you choose not to be sacred. We're, we're, we're unfortunately in the woke culture and identity politics, we're, we're creating artificial wars between ideologies as if we were a group of Hatfoy, Hatf, uh, the Hatfields and McCoy clans, tribalism and uh, nationalism and destroying each other. All the while, do you have any idea how much money the richest people in America made just during the coronavirus? $58 billion additional money. And how much did you make? So when I challenged the working class, I said earlier in this show that they're not going to participate. They have not participated. It's not because they're not smart enough to know the cause is important to their well-being, their children and society. They just don't care. When you live in a bubble like the you know, virtue shaming entire Hollywood, you know, worthless community. I, I despise them. I really do. I cannot stand how they act so superior. They have to live on a certain neighborhood and have gated uh, gates around their property and armed guards, and they have to have exclusivity in all things, and they feel entitled to it. And they're going to tell me that how I should live my life? No, you're not an example of anything that should be leading. And yet this is true in every area of our life. So who exactly is supposed to stop global warming and reverse it? Who's supposed to stop, you know, the destruction of the middle class? Who's supposed to stop the people that many people are in contempt of in today's media? You start raising hell about, you know, the working class person. Somehow they're illiterate. They're all redneck. Everyone who isn't on your side is now a deplorable. Do you have any idea how racist that is? how improper that language is. You're talking about people of all walks of life, of all backgrounds. These are the lay people. These are the skilled people. These are the people that build your homes. These are the glaziers and the plumbers and the electricians and carpenters and masons. These are the people that are going to be there to sew your clothes or to grow your food. Do you have any idea what it's like? Get out of that damn ivory tower that you live in and come out into the real world. Go see what it's like. Spend a week on a farm in Nebraska when they went through the floods this year and see a person have to decide whether or not they have to close down the farm that's been there for five generations because they can't grow anything. They're flooded out. And now they're a part of the problem because they're not on your side. They have a different value system. They value other things that you don't. So anyone who doesn't value what you value is suddenly a racist or a, a no good. And the media is in one course of denunciation. My God, this is Germany in 1932 when Rome's brown shirts under Goering. And by the way, Adolf Hitler selected Goering before he became chief of the uh, Luftwaffe. He was the head of all domestic and he fired all the police. So there was no one protecting the public. And that's when the brown shirts came in and destroyed the Communist Party, destroyed the Socialist Party, destroyed anyone who was a populist. Then they went after the intellects, the artists, until they had total control. Well, what the hell's happening now? You want to get rid of the police? Exactly what's supposed to take their place? Why don't we just have all police in America, 800,000 more or less, take a month off? After all, if you listen to the people in the media and their radical spokespersons, we don't need you. You're worthless. You're despicable. You're all racist. Even though 54% are African-American or Latino, you're still racist somehow. Okay, and you're responsible. If there's one dead person, you're all responsible, all 800,000. Gee whiz, how unique is the selectivity of that kind of mindset? What the hell do you think would happen to America? You think all the gang members are going to say, mm, the police are gone, so let's not rape, destroy, beat. Let's not vandalize. Yeah, we had the police and you saw the vandalization. Now imagine without the police. You want to get rid of the bad police? Fine. You want to get rid of all police? Then you've lost your mind. And unfortunately, a whole generation is afraid to speak out. We've become a nation of cowards. But remember, someday, those of you who are pushing your political and ideological agenda, you're going to push it in the wrong face, and you've got 250 million Americans who are going to push back 
I want you to read what Matt Tabibi had to say. I don't have time. I'm going to read it tomorrow. It's very important. But just remember, a lot of people are angry. For those of you who are angry and feel frustrated, this Sunday I'm doing what will be the most important webinar of my career. I've been working on it for six months before coronavirus. It's what to do from here forward to change the quality of your life. Seeking a different life in rural America. All the jobs, all of the opportunities, a different way of living. How do you get started? Which are the best places? I have to take into consideration every single state, every part of every state. Do they, are they, are they likely to go through what Seattle's going through and uh, uh, cities in uh, Oregon are going through and Los Angeles and San Francisco? Total anarchy and chaos, which is only going to get worse. People don't want that. People don't want to live in New York. They don't want mandatory vaccines where people can come and arrest you and force you to take a coronavirus vaccine. Boy, that will be an epidemic of death and destruction. People don't want that. Okay, so where are you going to go? How are you going to get there? Every tool you need to survive in the future and have a higher quality of life, away from those places that are going to be the flashpoints, we're just the beginning. They took over the area around the governor's, uh, the mayor's house. <clears throat> now watch what other areas they take around. Do you think these are all spontaneous? Do you think all these acts of violence are spontaneous? Does just suddenly, ha suddenly occur? Well, then you ought to watch the video that was recorded of one of the leaders talking about how it's okay to burn down houses and buildings. Is it? What if someone's in that building? What if you killed someone in the building? Is that just collateral? Are you having the same mindset of the Defense Department back in the Vietnam War, any war since then? Collateral damage is acceptable because our ultimate goal is some a statement of power? My God, we're a nation breaking down, except for the average person. They're, they've been punished enough, and maybe it took this quarantine with the coronavirus. Maybe it took watching thousands of people in New York die because of Governor Cuomo's Radical idea. Well, people are now angry enough that they're saying goodbye, New York, goodbye, Los Angeles, goodbye, Pennsylvania, goodbye, Chicago, goodbye, San Francisco, and they're going elsewhere. So this Sunday, I'm going to show you the places around the world to go, places in the United States and other countries where there's better freedom, more freedom of choice, better quality of life, more progressive ideals, more progressive people, and how to survive when you get there. Go to prn.fm if you want to join us. Have a nice day, everyone.